This is section 23 of the complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Political Thoughts and Reflections, read by John Greenman. Of Fundamentals. Every party, when they find a maxim for their turn, they presently call it a fundamental. They think they nail it with a peg of iron, whereas in truth they only tie it with a wisp of straw. The word soundeth so well that the impropriety of it hath been the less observed. But as weighty as the word appeareth, no feather hath been more blown about in the world than this word fundamental. It is one of those mistakes that it sometimes may be of use, but it is a mistake still. Fundamental is used as men use their friends, commend them when they have need of them, and when they fall out, find a hundred objections to them. Fundamental is a pedestal that men set everything upon that they would not have broken. It is a nail every body would use to fix that which is good for them, for all men would have that principle to be immovable that serves their use at the time. Everything that is created is mortal. Ergo, all fundamentals of human creation will die. A true fundamental must be like the foundation of a house. If it is undermined, the whole house falleth. The fundamentals in divinity have been changed in several ages of the world. They have made no difficulty in the several councils to destroy and excommunicate men for asserting things that at other times were called fundamentals. Philosophy, astronomy, etc., have changed their fundamentals as the men of art no doubt called them at the time. Motion of the earth, etc. Even in morality, one may more properly say, there should be fundamentals allowed than that there are any which in strictness can be maintained. However, this is the least uncertain foundation. Fundamental is less improperly applied here than anywhere else. Wise and good men will in all ages stick to some fundamentals, look upon them as sacred, and preserve an inviolable respect for them. But mankind in general make morality a more malleable thing than it ought to be there is then no certain fundamental but in nature and yet there are objections too it is a fundamental in nature that the son should not kill the father and yet the senate of venice gave a reward to a son who brought in his father's head according to a proclamation salus populi is an unwritten law yet that doth not hinder but that it is sometimes very visible and as often as it is so, it supersedeth all other laws which are subordinate things compared. The great punishments upon self-murder are arguments that it was rather a tempting sin to be discouraged than an unnatural act. It is a fundamental that where a man intendeth no hurt, he should receive none, yet manslaughter, etc., are cases of mercy. That a boy under ten shall not suffer death, yet where malicia suplet etatem otherwise that there were witches much shaken of late that the king is not to be deceived in his grant the practical fundamental the contrary that what is given to god cannot be alienated yet in practice it is by treaties etc and even by the church itself when they get a better bargain by it i can make no other definition of a true fundamental than this viz that whatever a man hath a desire to do or to hinder if he hath uncontested and irresistible power to effect it that he will certainly do it if he thinketh he hath that power though he hath it not he will certainly go about it some would define a fundamental to be the settling the laws of nature and common equity in such a sort as that they may be well administered even in this case there can be nothing fixed, but it must vary for the good of the whole. A constitution cannot make itself. Somebody made it, not at once, but at several times. It is alterable, 
and by that draweth nearer perfection and without suiting itself to differing times and circumstances it could not live its life is prolonged by changing seasonably the several parts of it at several times the reverence that is given to a fundamental in a general unintelligible notion would be much better applied to that supremacy or power which is set up in every nation in differing shapes that altereth the constitution as often as the good of the people requireth it neither king nor people would now like just the original constitution without any varyings if kings are only answerable to god that doth not secure them even in this world since if god upon the appeal thinketh fit not to stay he maketh the people his instruments i am persuaded that wherever any single man had power to do himself right upon a deceitful trustee he would do it that thought well digested would go a great way towards the discouraging invasions upon rights etc i lay down then as a fundamental first that in every constitution there is some power which neither will nor ought to be bounded two that the king's prerogative should be as plain a thing as the people's obedience three that a power which may by parity of reason destroy the whole laws can never be reserved by the laws four that in all limited governments it must give the governor power to hurt but it can never be so interpreted as to give him power to destroy for then in effect it would cease to be a limited government five that severity be rare and great for as tacitus saith of nero quote, frequent punishments made the people call even his justice cruelty unquote. six that it is necessary to make the instruments of power easy for power is hard enough to be digested by those under it at the best seven that the people are never so perfectly backed but that they will kick and fling if not stroked at seasonable times eight that a prince must think if he loseth his people he can never regain them it is both wise and safe to think so nine that kings assuming prerogative teach the people to do so too ten that prerogative is a trust eleven that they are not the king's laws nor the parliament's laws but the laws of england in which after they have passed by the legislative power the people have the property and the king the executive part twelve that no abilities should qualify a noted knave to be employed in business a knave can by none of his dexterities make amends for the scandal he bringeth upon the crown thirteen that those who will not be bound by the laws rely upon crimes a third way was never found in the world to secure any government fourteen that a seaman be a seaman a cabinet councillor a man of business an officer an officer fifteen in corrupted governments the place is given for the sake of the man in good ones the man is chosen for the sake of the place sixteen that crowds at court are made up of such as would deceive the real worshippers are few seventeen that salus populi is the greatest of all fundamentals yet not altogether an immovable one it is a fundamental for a ship to ride at anchor when it is in port but if a storm cometh the cable must be cut eighteen property is not a fundamental right in one sense because in the beginning of the world there was none so that property itself was an innovation introduced by laws property is only secured by trusting it in the best hands and those are generally chosen who are least likely to deceive but if they should they have a legal authority to abuse as well as use the power with which they are trusted and there is no fundamental can stand in their way or be allowed as an exception to the authority that was vested in them nineteen magna carta would fain be made to pass for a fundamental 
and sir edward coke would have it that the grand charter was for the most part declaratory of the principal grounds of the fundamental laws of england if that refers to the common law it must be made out that everything in magna carta is always and at all times necessary in itself to be kept or else the denying a subsequent parliament the right of repealing any law doth by consequence deny the preceding parliament the right of making it but they are fain to say it was only a declarative law which is very hard to be proved yet suppose it you must either make the common law so stated a thing that all men know it beforehand or else universally acquiesce in it whenever it is alleged from the affinity it hath to the law of nature now i would fain know whether the common law is capable of being defined and whether it does not hover in the clouds like the prerogative and bolteth out like lightning to be made use of for some particular occasion if so the government of the world is left to a thing that cannot be defined and if it cannot be defined you know not what it is so that the supreme appeal is we know not what we submit to god almighty though he is incomprehensible and yet he hath set down his methods but for this world there can be no government without a stated rule and a supreme power not to be controlled neither by the dead nor the living the laws under the protection of the king govern in the ordinary administration the extraordinary power is in the acts of parliament from whence there can be no appeal but to the same power at another time to say a power is supreme and not arbitrary is not sense it is acknowledged supreme and therefore etc if the common law is supreme then those are so who judge what is the common law and if none but the parliament can judge so there is an end of the controversy there is no fundamental for the parliament may judge as they please that is they have the authority but they may judge against right their power is good though their act is ill no good man will outwardly resist the one or inwardly approve the other there is then no other fundamental but that every supreme power must be arbitrary fundamental is a word used by the laity as the word sacred is by the clergy to fix everything to themselves they have a mind to keep that nobody else may touch it of princes a prince who will not undergo the difficulty of understanding must undergo the danger of trusting a wise prince may gain such an influence that his countenance would be the last appeal where it is not so in some degree his authority is precarious a prince must keep up the power of his countenance which is not the least of his prerogatives the conscience as well as the prerogative of a king must be restrained or loosened as is best for his people it may without scandal be made of stretching leather but it must be drawn by a steady hand a king that lets intercession prevail will not be long worshipped a prince used to war getteth a military logic that is not very well suited to the civil administration if he maketh war successfully he groweth into a demigod if without success the world throweth him as much below humanity as they had before set him above it a hero must be sometimes allowed to make bold strokes without being fettered by strict reason he is to have some generous irregularities in his reasoning or else he will not be a good thing of his kind princes their rewards of servants when a prince giveth any man a very extravagant reward it looketh as if it was rather for an ill thing than a good one both the giver and receiver are out of countenance where they are ill suited and ill applied serving princes will make men proud at first and humble at last resolving to serve well and at the same time resolving to please is generally resolving to do what is not to be done a man that will serve well must often rule the master so hard that it will hurt him 
it is thought an unsociable quality in a court to do one's duty better than other men nothing is less forgiven than setting patterns men have no mind to follow men are so unwilling to displease a prince that it is as dangerous to inform him right as to serve him wrong where men get by pleasing and lose by serving the choice is so easy that nobody can miss it princes their secrets men are so proud of prince secrets that they will not see the danger of them when a prince trusteth a man with a dangerous secret he would not be sorry to hear the bell tolled for him love of the subjects to a prince the heart of the subjects yieldeth but a lean crop where it is not cultivated by a wise prince the good will of the governed will be starved if it is not fed by the good conduct of the governors suffering for princes those who merit because they suffered are so very angry with those that made them suffer that though their services may deserve employment their temper rendereth them unfit for it of ministers the world dealeth with ministers of state as they do with ill fiddlers ready to kick them downstairs for playing ill though few of the fault-finders understand their music enough to be good judges a minister who undertaketh to make his master very great if he faileth is ruined for his folly if he succeedeth he is feared for his skill a good statesman may sometimes mistake as much by being too humble as by being too proud he must take upon him in order to do his duty and not in order to the setting himself out a minister is not to plead the king's command for such things as he may in justice be supposed to have directed it is dangerous to serve where the master hath the privilege not to be blamed it is hard for a prince to esteem the parts of a minister without either envying or fearing them and less dangerous for a minister to show all the weakness than all the strength of his understanding there are so many things necessary to make up a good minister that no wonder there are so few of them in the world there is hardly a rasher thing than for a man to venture to be a good minister a minister of state must have a spirit of liberal economy not a restrained frugality he must enlarge his family soul and suit it to the bigger compass of a kingdom a prince should be asked why he will do a thing but not why he hath done it if the boys were to choose a schoolmaster it should be one that would not whip them the same thing if the courtiers were to choose a minister they would have a great many play-days no rods and leave to rob orchards the parallel will hold wicked ministers a cunning minister will engage his master to begin with a small wrong step which will insensibly engage him in a great one a man that hath the patience to go by steps may deceive one much wiser than himself state business is a cruel trade good nature is a bungler in it instruments of state ministers men in business are in as much danger from those that work under them as from those that work against them when the instruments bend under the weight of their business it is like a weak-legged horse that brings his rider down with him as when they are too weak they let a man fall so when they are too strong they throw him off if men of business did not forget how apt their tools are to break or fail they would shut up shop they must use things called men under them who will spoil the best scheme that can be drawn by human understanding tools that are blunt cannot cut at all and those that are sharp are apt to cut in the wrong place great difference between a good tool and a good workman when the tools will be workmen they cut their own fingers and everybody's else of the people 
there is more strength in union than in number witness the people that in all ages have been scurvily used because they could so seldom agree to do themselves right the more the weaker may be as good a proverb as the more the merrier a people can no more stand without government than a child can go without leading strings as old and as big as a nation is it can't go by itself and must be led the numbers that make its strength are at the same time the cause of its weakness and incapacity of acting men have so discovered themselves to one another that union is become a mere word in reality impracticable they trust or suspect not upon reason but ill-grounded fame they should be at ease saved protected etc and give nothing for it the lower sort of men must be indulged the consolation of finding fault with those above them without that they would be so melancholy that it would be dangerous considering their numbers they are too many to be told of their mistakes and for that reason they are never to be cured of them the body of the people are generally either so dead that they cannot move or so mad that they cannot be reclaimed to be neither all in a flame nor quite cold requireth more reason than great numbers can ever attain the people can seldom agree to move together against a government but they can to sit still and let it be undone those that will be martyrs for the people must expect to be repaid only by their vanity or their virtue a man that will head the mob is like a bull let loose tied about with squibs and crackers he must be half mad that goeth about it yet at some times shall be too hard for all the wise men in a kingdom for though good sense speaketh against madness yet it is out of countenance whenever it meets it it would be a greater reproach to the people that their favor is short-lived if their malice was not so too the thoughts of the people have no regular motion they come out by starts there is an accumulative cruelty in a number of men though none in particular are ill-natured the angry buzz of a multitude is one of the bloodiest noises in the world of government an exact administration and a good choice of proper instruments doth insensibly make the government in a manner absolute without assuming it the best definition of the best government is that it hath no inconveniences but such as are supportable but inconveniences there must be the interest of the governors and the governed is in reality the same but by mistakes on both sides it is generally very differing he who is a courtier by trade and by the country gentleman who will be popular right or wrong help to keep up this unreasonable distinction there are as many apt to be angry at being well as at being ill-governed for most men to be well governed must be scurvily used as mankind is made the keeping it in order is an ill-natured office it is like a great gallery where the officers must be whipping with little intermission if they will do their duty it is a disorderly government as in a river the lightest things swim at the top a nation is best to be judged by the government it is under at the time mankind is moulded to good or ill according as the power over it is well or ill directed a nation is a mass of dough it is the government that kneadeth it into form where learning and trade flourish in a nation they produce so much knowledge and that so much equality among men that the greatness of dependencies is lost but the nation in general will be the better for it for if the government be wise it is the more easily governed if not the bad government is the more easily overturned by men's being more united against it than when they depended upon great men who might sooner be gained over and weakened by being divided there is more reason for allowing luxury in a military government than in another the perpetual exercise of war not only excuseth but recommendeth the entertainments in the winter 
in another it groweth into a habit of uninterrupted expenses and idle follies and the consequences of them to a nation become irrecoverable clergy if the clergy did not live like temporal men all the power of princes could not bring them under the temporal jurisdiction they who may be said to be of god almighty's household should show by their lives that he hath a well-disciplined family the clergy in this sense of divine institution that god hath made mankind so weak that it must be deceived religion it is a strange thing that the way to save men's souls should be such a cunning trade as to require a skilful master the time spent in praying to god might be better employed in deserving well from him men think praying the easier task of the two and therefore choose it the people would not believe in god at all if they were not permitted to believe wrong in him the several sorts of religion in the world are little more than so many spiritual monopolies if their interests could be reconciled their opinions would be so too men pretend to serve god almighty who doth not need it but make use of him because they need him factions are like pirates that set out false colors when they come near a booty religion is put under deck most men's anger about religion is as if two men should quarrel for a lady they neither of them care for of prerogative power and liberty a prerogative that tendeth to the dissolution of all laws must be void in itself felo de se, for a prerogative is a law the reason of any law is that no man's will should be a law the king is the life of the law and cannot have a prerogative that is mortal to it the law is to have a soul in it or it is a dead thing the king is by his sovereign power to add warmth and vigor to the meaning of the law we are by no means to imagine there is such an antipathy between them that the prerogative like a basilisk is to kill the law whenever it looks upon it the prince hath very rarely use of his prerogative but hath constantly a great advantage by the laws they attribute to the pope indeed that all the laws of the church are in his breast but then he hath the holy ghost for his learned counsel etc the people's obedience must be plain and without evasions the prince's prerogative should be so too king charles i made this answer to the petition of right to the observation whereof he held himself obliged in conscience as well as of his prerogative Quote, that the people's liberties strengthen the king's prerogative and the king's prerogative is to defend the people's liberties Unquote. that prince's declarations allow the original of government to come from the people prerogative never yet pretended to repealing the first ground of prerogative was to enable the prince to do good not to do everything if the ground of a king's desire of power be his assurance of himself that he will do no hurt by it is it not an argument for subjects to desire to keep that which they will never abuse it must not be such a prerogative as giveth the government the rickets all the nourishment to go to the upper part and the lower starved as a prince is in danger who calleth a stronger than himself to his assistance so when prerogative useth necessity for an argument it calleth in a stronger thing than itself the same reason may overturn it necessity too is so plain a thing that everybody sees it so that the magistrate hath no great privilege in being the judge of it necessity therefore is a dangerous argument for princes since wherever it is real it constitutes every man a magistrate and gives as great a power of dispensing to every private man as a prince can claim it is not so proper to say that prerogative justifieth force as that force supporteth prerogative they have not been such constant friends but that they have had terrible fallings out all powers are of god and between permission and appointment well considered 
there is no real difference in a limited monarchy prerogative and liberty are as jealous of one another as any two neighboring states can be of their respective encroachments they ought not to part for small bickerings and must bear little jealousies without breaking for them power is so apt to be insolent and liberty to be saucy that they are very seldom upon good terms they are both so quarrelsome that they will not easily enter into a fair treaty for indeed it is hard to bring them together they ever quarrel at a distance power and liberty are respectively managed in the world in a manner not suitable to their value and dignity they are both so abused that it justifieth the satires that are generally made upon them and they are so in possession of being misapplied that instead of censuring their being abused it is more reasonable to wonder whenever they are not so they are perpetually wrestling and have had their turns when they have been thrown to have their bones broken by it if they were not both apt to be out of breath there would be no living if prerogative will urge reason to support it it must bear reason when it resisteth it it is a diminution instead of a glory to be above treating upon equal terms with reason if the people were designed to be the sole property of the supreme magistrate sure god would have made them of a differing and subordinate species as he hath the beasts that by the inferiority of their nature they might the better submit to the dominion of mankind if none were to have liberty but those who understand what it is there would not be many freed men in the world when the people contend for their liberty they seldom get anything by their victory but new masters liberty can neither be got nor kept but by so much care that mankind generally are unwilling to give the price for it and therefore in the contest between ease and liberty the first hath generally prevailed of laws laws are generally not understood by three sorts of persons viz by those that make them by those that execute them and by those that suffer if they break them men seldom understand any laws but those they feel precepts like fomentations must be rubbed into us and with a rough hand too if the laws could speak for themselves they would complain of the lawyers in the first place there is more learning now required to explain a law made than went to the making it the law hath so many contradictions and varyings from itself that the law may not improperly be called a law-breaker it is become too changeable a thing to be defined it is made little less a mystery than the gospel the clergy and the lawyers like the freemasons may be supposed to take an oath not to tell the secret the men of law have a bias to their calling in the interpretations they make of the law of parliaments the parliaments are so altered from their original constitution that between the court and the country the house instead of being united is like troops of a contrary party facing one another and watching their advantage even the well-meaning men who have good sense too have their difficulties in an assembly what they offer honestly for a good end will be skilfully improved for an ill one it is strange that a gross mistake should live a minute in an assembly one would expect that it should be immediately stifled by their discerning faculties but practice convinceth that a mistake is nowhere better entertained in parliaments men wrangle in behalf of liberty that do as little care for it as they deserve it where the people in parliament give a good deal of money in exchange for anything from the crown a wise prince can hardly have an ill bargain the present gift begetteth more it is a politic kind of generation and whenever a parliament doth not bring forth it is the unskilfulness of the government that is the cause of the miscarriage parliaments would bind and limit one another and enact that such and such things shall not be made precedence there is not a word of sense in this language which yet is to be understood the sense of the nation 
and is printed as solemnly as if it was sense of parties the best party is but a kind of a conspiracy against the rest of the nation they put everybody else out of their protection like the jews to the gentiles all others are the offscourings of the world men value themselves upon their principles so as to neglect practice abilities industry etc party cutteth off one half of the world from the other so that the mutual improvement of men's understanding by conversing etc is lost and men are half undone when they lose the advantage of knowing what their enemies think of them it is like faith without works they take it for a dispensation from all other duties which is the worst kind of dispensing power it groweth to be the master thought the eagerness against one another at home being a nearer object extinguisheth that which we ought to have against our foreign enemies and few men's understandings can get above overvaluing the danger that is nearest in comparison of that more remote it turneth all thought into talking instead of doing men get a habit of being unuseful to the public by turning in a circle of wrangling and railing which they cannot get out of and it may be remarked that a speculative coxcomb is not only unuseful but mischievous a practical coxcomb under discipline may be made use of it maketh a man thrust his understanding into a corner and confine it till by degrees he destroys it party is generally an effect of wantonness peace and plenty which beget humor pride etc and that is called zeal and public spirit they forget insensibly that there is anybody in the world but themselves by keeping no other company so they miscalculate cruelly and thus parties mistake their strength by the same reason that private men overvalue themselves for we by finding fault with others build up a partial esteem of ourselves upon the foundation of their mistakes so men in parties find faults with those in the administration not without reason but forget that they would be exposed to the same objections and perhaps greater if it was their adversary's turn to have the fault-finding part there are men who shine in a faction and make a figure by opposition who would stand in a worse light if they had the preferments they struggled for it looketh so like courage but nothing that is like is the same to go to the extreme that men are carried away with it and blown up out of their senses by the wind of popular applause that which looketh bold is of a great object that the people can discern but that which is wise is not so easily seen it is one part of it that it is not seen but at the end of a design those who are disposed to be wise too late are apt to be valiant too early most men enter into a party rashly and retreat from it as shamefully as they encourage one another at first so they betray one another at last and because every qualification is capable of being corrupted by the excess they fall upon the extreme to fix mutual reproaches upon one another party is little less than an inquisition where men are under such a discipline in carrying on the common cause as leaves no liberty of private opinion it is hard to produce an instance where a party did ever succeed against a government except they had a good handle given them no original party ever prevailed in a turn it brought up something else but the first projectors were thrown off if there are two parties a man ought to adhere to that which he disliketh least though in the whole he doth not approve it for whilst he doth not list himself in one or the other party he is looked upon as such a straggler that he is fallen upon by both therefore a man under such a misfortune of singularity is neither to provoke the world nor disquiet himself by taking any particular station it becometh him to live in the shade and keep his mistakes from giving offence but if they are his opinions he cannot put them off 
as he doth his clothes happy those who are convinced so as to be of the general opinions ignorance maketh most men go into party and shame keepeth them from getting out of it more men hurt others they do not know why than for any reason if there was any party entirely composed of honest men it would certainly prevail but both the honest men and the knaves resolve to turn one another off when the business is done they by turns defame all england so nobody can be employed that hath not been branded there are few things so criminal as a place of courts the court may be said to be a company of well-bred fashionable beggars at court if a man hath too much pride to be a creature he hath better stay at home a man who will rise at court must begin by creeping upon all four a place at court like a place in heaven is to be got by being much upon one's knees there are hardly two creatures of a more differing species than the same man when he is pretending to a place and when he is in possession of it men's industry is spent in receiving the rents of a place there is little left for discharging the duty of it some places have such a corrupting influence upon the man that it is a supernatural thing to resist it some places lie so fair to entertain corruption that it looketh like renouncing a due perquisite not to go into it if a getting fool would keep out of business he would grow richer in a court than a man of sense one would wonder that in a court where there is so little kindness there should be so much whispering men must brag of kind letters from court at the same time that they do not believe one word of them men at court think so much of their own cunning that they forget other men's after a revolution you see the same men in the drawing-room and within a week the same flatterers of punishment wherever a government knows when to show the rod it will not often be put to use it but between the want of skill and the want of honesty faults generally either escape punishment or are mended to no purpose men are not hanged for stealing horses but that horses may not be stolen wherever a knave is not punished an honest man is laughed at a cheat to the public is thought infamous and yet to accuse him is not thought an honorable part what a paradox tis an ill method to make the aggravation of the crime a security against the punishment so that the danger is not to rob but not to rob enough treason must not be inlaid work for several pieces it must be an entire piece of itself a cumulative in that case is a murdering word that carrieth injustice and no sense in it an influence though never so rational should go no farther than to justify a suspicion not so far as to inflict a punishment nothing is so apt to break with stretching as an inference and nothing so ridiculous as to see how fools will abuse one End of Political Thoughts and Reflections Read by John Greenman